Never before has a Chinese head of state cancelled a G20 meeting, the forum for the most important industrialized and emerging countries. Xi Jinping is now sending his premier, Li, to New Delhi. This will most likely be seen as an affront by host Modi. Yet Xi and Modi certainly pursue common interests against Western dominance. On the other hand, they are arch rivals with leadership aspirations for the global south. In addition, China's economy is weakening, while India is catching up enormously. So on to the point we ask, India booms, China cools. What does it mean for the rest of the world? Welcome to this week's To The Point. I'm Javier Arguedas, and I'm glad to be joined by today's guests. I'm going to introduce them to you. Wendelin von Bredo is the senior Germany correspondent for The Economist, based in Berlin. Felix Li is a journalist, a longtime correspondent in China, and currently works for the specialist German news outlet China Table. And Isha Bhatia is my colleague from DW. She is joining us from Delhi. To all of you, thank you very much for being with us. And let's cut right to the chase. Felix, I'd like to start with you. Xi Jinping certainly knows how symbolic it is not to attend a G20 summit for the very first time. What do you make of his decision? Well, officially there's no or there's no official announcement, so we do not know for sure what the reasons why he's not attending the G20 summit in Delhi. But I think it's not so much uh, meant against India. I mean, there are rivalries, there are disputes, border disputes, but they existed, they exist already for a longer time. So I don't think this is the current reason why he's not attending. If I would interpret something, uh, uh, I think he wa Xi Jinping wants to show that G20 is not the most important meeting anymore. And this is more meant against uh, uh, the Western countries. On BRICS, he attended two weeks ago in Johannesburg. Uh, the Western countries weren't uh, uh, at, at the BRICS. On the G20s, uh, the Western countries are part of it. So he wants to show a little bit, uh, so it's a little bit meant, I think, more meant against the West, especially as, uh, against the USA. That's a very important perspective. And yet we know that the G20 is highly symbolic. Isha, uh, we've seen many reports on how big the G20 summit has been promoted inside of India. How big a blow is Xi's absence for the host country? India is not reacting in a way that it is a blow, and I completely agree with Lee. Uh, the official statement that India has given is that uh, this has got nothing to do with India. Uh, the Foreign Minister S. Jai Shankar, and in fact, even the Indian Sherpa, Amitabh Khan, they have gone on record and said that in the past also, a lot of leaders have had to miss uh, the summit because of various reasons. Of course, this is the first time that China is missing, but of course, uh, he is sending his representative and all the discussions, all the meetings will be done with the representative. So China is not missing. It is the leader that is missing. And uh, very recently, Jai Shankar even uh, went on to say in an interview that um, the countries, he meant China and Russia, they would know best why they are doing it. He signaled towards the West. He did not name West. He did not say US or Europe or anyone, but he did signal that this is probably China's way of showing uh, to the West that G20 can't be all about the West because China, as Lee said, China was there for the BRICS. China, uh, Xi Jinping has met Narendra Modi in BRICS. So it does not look like it as of now that China is trying to block India when it comes to G20. So if it's not a blow to India, it certainly is for the platform, as we heard, Vendelin. Do you agree with that assessment? And if so, how much does it affect the possibility to actually find common ground in the summit? I agree with that assessment. I would, however, add that I think one of the additional reasons might be that he just feels he should not leave China at the moment. The economy is in really poor shape. Plus, there's some political turmoil at home that we may not even know about. I mean, there's certainly something going on, but, you know, details are sketchy. So I think in addition to all the other reasons, I think maybe he just feels it's not a good moment to leave Beijing. Um, well, there are two, Putin and Xi are missing, right? So um, in terms of finding common ground for the big challenges of our time, I do think that makes it more difficult, right? Because you have a big chunk of the represented of the world population not represented in, in some ways. Um, I still think, you know, you can probably achieve important 
at least symbolically very important things, but it's it's not how it was meant to be, I think, initially. For sure. And the other uh, important aspect is that this might leave the stage free for India to become the so-called voice of the global south. Uh, Isha, do you think this is among Modi's ambitions to become the bigger voice, at least in front of the West? Absolutely. And uh, India, and especially Modi and his team, they've never shied away from saying that they want to be the big brother in the global south. In fact, um, as I was mentioning, the foreign minister, very recently, he even went on to say that uh, in the beginning of last year, we, he mentioned India, that we started using the term global south that was not being used for a very long time. And we made sure that uh, we tell the world that there is a difference between the global north and the global south. And the global north is actually where all the decisions are taken and global south is lagging behind. So we really went ahead and talked about it. And now the whole world is talking about it. Now the Western countries are also thinking about the global south. So uh, wherever possible, Modi and his team, they are taking credit for everything good that's happening in Global South and that the countries of the Global South are uh, being pushed on the main stage. Except there is a gigantic powerhouse on the way. The G20 represents a whopping 85% of the world's economic power. Xi Jinping didn't only turn his back on the West or Joe Biden, but also, in a way, on India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Let's have a look at the current state of the Indo-Chinese relations. August in South Africa, the BRICS summit where Modi and Xi Jinping united against the domination of the West. But in the global South, each lays claim to the status of economic superpower, a rivalry with historic roots. For decades, China and India have been fighting over territory in the Himalayas. Xi's latest provocation, a map that declares Indian claim territory as Chinese. The authoritarian leader of the world's second largest economy has been expanding Chinese dominance for years. In the Indian Ocean, too, his instrument of power, the Belt and Road Initiative. Narendra Modi, the Hindu nationalist prime minister of the world's largest democracy, deals ruthlessly with political opponents and minorities. He's steering his country steeply upwards. There's no other place where the economy is growing as fast as in India, most recently overtaking China for five quarters in a row. By the end of the decade, India could become the world's third largest economy, with a population that is larger and younger than China's. Modi's latest triumph, India's first moon landing, bringing it in line with China. Is the balance of power shifting in India's favor? And I'm going to throw that question directly to you, Vendeline. Is it shifting in favor of India? Um, I do think there's a rebalancing of power, uh, mainly uh, or, or certainly in big part because the Chinese economy is is, is not in good shape, and I don't think any and I don't think it's going to recover anytime soon. Uh, youth unemployment is very high. There's that big property crisis, and the property sector is so important in China. I think it's responsible for. Uh, a quarter of GDP and employs, you know, millions of people. So that's certainly, you know, that one economic power waning whilst India is actually doing really well. So in that sense, there's certainly a rebalancing of power. Politically, India is a democracy, albeit an imperfect one, but it is a democracy, whereas China isn't. So again, India has an advantage. So absolutely, I do think there's a rebalancing of power between those two incredibly important countries. And how do you think that is perceived on the other side, Felix? Do you think China sees India as a big rival, as a threat maybe even? Not so much, no, at least not yet. Uh, uh, because uh, from the size of the economy, uh, even though India has surpassed uh, on population, but on the size of the economy, uh, China is still so much bigger than India and the Chinese know it. And the, I totally agree, China at the moment has huge economic problems and they will not uh, disappear uh, uh, very soon. Uh, what's new about China? So far, uh, until recently, uh, economic growth was the top number one, one priority yeah. on everything. We didn't know much about how politics uh, worked in China, but at least we could somehow trust that uh, economic growth is a very important target. 
um, this has changed under Xi Jinping. And uh, so somehow it is a little bit uh, also taken into account uh, to have less growth in China at the moment, uh, despite the problems with the uh, property uh, bubble. Uh, because China, of course, is also suffering from the sanctions by the US, the tech technology sanctions. And this is taken into account. China, we are talking about de-risking, decoupling from China in Europe. China is already doing it. They want to decouple on especially, they want to get less dependent on uh, uh, Western technologies. And on the other hand, they, uh, uh, and that means uh, for, uh, at least for the um, for a short time, this will uh, reduce the economic growth uh, because they're trying to develop uh, their own technology, and this of course means, uh, uh, for the meantime, that it m might hurt the economy. But Felix, when we talk about uh, technology specifically, India has also banned different companies from China operating in their country. Uh, how do you think that plays into the equation? It's uh, uh, not on the, on the agenda yet, I would say, at least not on the uh, top 10 agenda as a subject. Uh, I think at the moment, uh, India is also not seen as a main competitor, not yet, maybe in a future time. Uh, the main problem China has at the moment to deal, especially with the US, uh, uh, the trade uh, war and all the technology sanctions uh, they do to each other. So this is uh, at the moment the bigger uh, topic, uh, the bigger issue in China. Let's shift the perspective to India, because from what we're hearing, China does not really seem to see India as a big threat. But sometimes, at least I have the perception that the rhetoric in India could be a little bit different. Um, talk us through how the perception is in the country uh, in this image of India as a rising superpower, maybe. Well, rising superpower and the next biggest thing, that is something that is being sold a lot here. And that has also got to do with the uh, elections that are coming up next year. Um, and in fact, hosting G20 in Delhi, which is a very difficult task uh, in a city such as Delhi, that is also a sign that the Modi government wanted to give to the people here that if we can do this, if we can manage this, then um, me and my government, we can actually take India to places. So uh, that is the the feeling right now. And uh, India is also talking about uh, becoming the third most important um, economy in the next few years. We're talking about 2027 already. And um, although there are a lot of studies that show that uh, even if India were to just grow as status quo, it would still reach number three by the end of the decade. But uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi made sure that he takes the credit wherever possible, because as I said, it's election next year and uh, who would not want to take brownie points um, when when it's possible. And uh, as far as the rivalry with China is concerned, yes, there is a very strong sentiment uh, about rivalry with China. And uh, Modi keeps pushing about this 5 trillion economy that we will reach the third position. 5 trillion, the difference between India and China is still going to be huge because by the time India reaches 5 trillion, China would have crossed 25 trillion. So that's still a major difference. India would have uh, the opportunity to say that we are right behind US and China, but yet India is still way behind US and China. So um, as far as the feeling is concerned, yes, it's there, but um, India is not going to stand parallel with China. And maybe that's also a reason, Vendelin, that I wanted to ask you, uh, here in the West at least, uh, there's not this rhetoric of India being a big threat uh, as we often hear it with China. Do you think that's because of the same reason, that they're not really equal? They are not really equal. And I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I can see Felix's point that, that China doesn't perceive India really as a threat. But, but, but I do think there's a rivalry, and, 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 and your colleague in, in Delhi mentioned that. Um, and, and, and I do think China is taking this rival seriously. OK, there's still a very different sort of proportion. But India has the advantage that it's not, it doesn't have this very uh, complex, hostile relationship with America, right? America wants to trade with India, doesn't really want to trade with China. That's another huge advantage India has at the moment. I mean, they, may, <laughs> they, they, they could spoil that still relatively cordial relationship. But I mean, there are lots... India has at the moment quite a lot of things going for, for the country.
However, um, we were talking about that. Uh, when we talk about China, we talk very differently uh, about India in many parts of the world. Do you think there's sort of a double standard taking into consideration that uh, Narendra Modi is also being criticized in many respects. Uh, we just saw it in the piece, uh, the way uh, minorities are treated, uh, the way political opponents are treated. Uh, is there a double standard in your opinion? No, it's because uh, there is a huge difference. I mean, uh, yes, uh, uh, there are also human rights problems uh, India has, but India is a functioning democracy and China is not, and even worse, it Uh, we so far called it one-party dictatorship. Uh, we must say now it's a one-person dictatorship. So it's a pure dictatorship. It has become a pure dictatorship under Xi Jinping. And we sort of hoped in the last 30 years that, of course, China is still authoritarian, run by the Communist Party. But there was this hope, and there were good reason for this hope, that China will also be more uh, politically be more open and more liberal. liberal. But this has totally, this hope has vanished under Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping has turned uh, even the Communist Party un, into a one-person leadership. And this is a huge difference, uh, despite all, of, all the democratic problems India has, but this is a huge difference from India. And it's not the only problem. Uh, there certainly is talk of a Chinese downfall. China had shown the world how it is able to achieve record after record in economic performance, but those times seem long gone, and problems are taking over. Young, highly qualified, but jobless. The case for one in five people under the age of 24 living in China. The record figure was published last spring. Authorities have since suspended release of the monthly statistics, claiming they want to optimize the methodology. Many Chinese have lost their lust for consumption. All they can do is look on as the homes they saved up for aren't completed. Property developers are getting into financial difficulties. The largest Chinese property group, Evergrande, has the highest debt worldwide at over $300 billion. The Communist Party doesn't appear to be delivering on its promise of growth and prosperity. Exports in July were down 14.5% on the year before, imports down 12.4% measured in US dollars. China's official growth target of 5% by the end of 2023 seems unfeasible. Head of State Xi is calling on people to exercise historic patience. Promoting the virtue of hardship, he tells young people to eat bitterness. Is the Chinese economic miracle grinding to a halt? And I'm throwing that question to you, Felix. Is it grinding to a halt? Yes, the problems are huge. Uh, uh, the property crisis, the property bubble has burst, and this will take at least one decade uh, to, uh, to get over this. And it's also connected with another huge problem China has, the demographic problem. We know be because of the one-child policy, uh, 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 this will also hurt the Chinese economy. But we shouldn't underestimate how powerful the Chinese government also economically and financially is. So uh, uh, yes, uh, China has this huge economic problem. But uh, uh, China has also a lot of power to fight this. So uh, I don't know if you can call it the hope or something uh, that will China will become more modest, more uh, again. Uh, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I don't share this hope because uh, China has become such a, a powerful economy. Uh, uh, it will be able to, China will be able to deal with at least the biggest problems China has. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Can I just pick up on that? It, it, uh, you mentioned that before, and it's also very interesting that Xi's priority is not the economy anymore. Yeah. It's his foreign policy ambitions. And, you know, if he has big successes or perceive from the Chinese point of view, big successes on the foreign policy front, he will think, you know, that will appease the population and maybe paper over some economic hardships, which are real. I mean, in particular for, for young people, I, I forgot the precise number, but the, but the young unemployed is something like 20, 25 percent. I mean, it's very, very high. And that's, you know, of course, terribly frustrating for, for these youngsters. Yeah, as Joe question. Biden said, uh, China can become even more dangerous under Xi Jinping when the economic problems are rising, that he's becoming, uh, in foreign policy and geopolitically, even more dangerous. Mm.
But doesn't that go hand in hand, the economic performance and the success in foreign policy? When we talk about what this all means for the rest of the world, we have to talk about the African countries, we have to talk about Latin American countries. What happens if China doesn't have that power anymore? Sure, of course. I mean, to some extent, China can have these grand ambitions because it's such a powerful economy. It's already achieved that, right? I mean, it's, it has risen to the second biggest economy in the world. What does it mean? I mean, you know, look at the, the Belt and Road initiatives. You know, that's still going, right? It may be stalling at the moment, but China is very influential in, in other parts of the world, in Africa in particular. All of that still remains true. So, so I'm, I'm not saying by all means, you know, that, that we, should, we should discount China. But I, but I still think there is in India an interesting rival that has appeared and will manifest itself increasingly in the next few years. A rival that, however, might not be immune to that Chinese power. Isha, when we talk about dependence uh, on China, it is often said that China has uh, the, the bigger power, uh, especially with the disputes with India. What's your perception on that? Well, uh, that's... A difficult thing to say whether China has a bigger power. Uh, there are disputes between both the countries. There are border disputes, of course, and despite that, both the countries are still uh, trading partners with each other, and they can't do without each other. And uh, I agree with the, both, uh, both the panelists, uh, what they've said so far. So um, India is not going to stop trading with China, and neither is China going to close its uh, doors for India. Um, We've seen this new uh, card, uh, the map that has come up, where China has shown territories that are disputed and they are part of China in the map. And India has shown concerns over it that it can't be done because it's disputed territory. And despite that, none of them has stopped the channels. They are still talking whether Xi Jinping is coming to a G20 or not. They are still uh, in talks. And they are also not clubbing together against the West. They have their own interests, but they are meeting each other in SEO. They are meeting each other. Uh, in uh, G20. So it's, it's a strange amalgam that uh, the global south is uh, witnessing right now. The question, of course, here would also be whether India is a true alternative to investments in China, to trade with China, even as a lender. Felix, what's your take on that for the well, rest of the world? Uh... It's always good not to focus on China, uh, so much on China as the German economy has done in the last two decades. So uh, uh, India uh, uh, should be more on the focus. It would be a good thing. The problem is China's economy has become so important, especially for the Germans. And it will be very, very hard um, to switch to, to other regions. And it's not that all uh, we're talking about uh, uh, diversification to th Southeast Asia, to Latin America, to India. And it's not that these markets are, were all waiting for Volkswagen and Siemens and BASF to come. Um, they have developed also their own trade partners. So this will be a tough one, for, especially for the Germans, because they were so focused on China. But of course, uh, uh, in midterm or long term, it is also always good to have different partners and not to focus on especially a very uh, um, unstable or a politically uh, even dangerous country as China is. Because they often talk about values, Wendelin, do you think there's a true interest in actually following values when it comes to economic decisions and would that benefit India in this case? Um. I think sometimes CEOs pay a little bit lip service to these values. Sure, in theory, there is, I mean, I'm, if you'd ask them, they'd say, yes, of course, we care deeply about human rights, but often uh, business and commercial considerations prevail. If you look at the figures, Germany's German business's investment in China has not really gone down. Even though, you know, there's the new China, the government's China strategy, the government's really encouraging German companies to diversify. But some of the biggest DAX companies have are making huge investments in China. You mentioned BASF, there's Volkswagen, you know. It, and it's partly because the Chinese market remains very attractive. And, and there's not an obvious, at the moment, not an obvious country that can replace it, at least not in the short term. In the longer term, probably. Probably yes, but in the short term, I think it's very difficult. It's a long road ahead. We have time for one last quick question. Uh, I'd like to start with you, Felix. In a multipolar world, will India be one of the poles? Yes, definitely. And what we have seen uh, two weeks ago at the BRICS is the big turning point, for us, especially for the Western countries, because uh, there we have seen uh, uh, BRICS 
15 years ago uh, didn't really exist. And now it has become a very important uh, gathering. And we're not talking only about the six or five countries which uh, joined the BRICS plus. We're talking about 40 other countries who are who want to join the BRICS. And this is should be a alarm sign for the Western countries yeah. that uh, that they have uh, that they haven't opened up uh, the, uh, the existing international institution and this would be only fair and a, an important step now that the Western countries should open this so not uh, the, so they, that all these countries are not only focusing on China and yeah we'll see how that plays out that's all we have time for thank you very much to all three of our guests and especially to you for watching remember you can watch this and all other shows on our YouTube channel searching DW News I'm Javier Arguedas until next time take care and goodbye